M&A appetite in LATAM. How hungry are investors for new markets? Welcome back to another panel discussion on Sigma Americas. And this time we have with us Susan Bream from MISCON. We have Andrea Gelfi from uh, Sao Posta. And we have Christina Romero from Loira. And we're here to discuss the M&A appetite across the LATAM region. And Susan, I'd like to start with you. How is the regulation across LATAM, or rather the lack of it, influencing the appetite uh, for investors to look into the region? Well, I think it depends. Thanks, Eman. I think it depends whether the investor is an operator or a financial investor. And within the operator mold also, uh, whether you're having an affiliate come partner with those operators within the region. So I, I think looking at our client profile, um, we are seeing uh, a, 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 a hedging uh, position really against Europe, um, possibly Asia, and a choice between Africa, the US and LATAM coming into play as far as those clients are concerned. And, and the, the slow pace of regulation or the uh, differences culturally are a factor, but they're not the determining factor, I don't think, for clients because they're used to complicated regulatory regimes. Uh, they, they understand that it is unpredictable. There are some large markets there for the for the taking if you can understand them well enough and partner locally so i i think you have some clients waiting in the wings others that have already positioned themselves very well um andre can talk about the uh, the supposed to bets and deal so early adopters in the market always do well and i think there are a slew of uh, both operators b2b uh, providers and investors who are watching and waiting. And I think the watching and the waiting is largely about how profitable and successful could they make a market entry into one of those LATAM jurisdictions. Yeah. Um, and talking about early uh, into market, Andres, a pleasure to have you with us. Tell us a bit more about the recent acquisition by Betsin of Sao Posta. And how did it work out for you guys? Okay, well, nice talking to you guys. A pleasure to be around and to share my experience with you. Um, well, it happened last year. We, we finalized the, the agreement with Betson in November. And since then, we had made some progress, some impressive progress, by the way, uh, to, to launch a proprietary platform uh, in the following days. Uh, our idea is to launch the brand in Brazil. Uh, basically, as Susan said, I mean, we, we are basically anticipating the, the, the regulation of sports betting that is also progressing. Last week, we had a presidential decree being published that formalized the whole ritual of how the, 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 the regulation will take place and how um, the, the concession regime will, will, will follow through. So, um, at this, at this moment, Suaposta, still Suaposta, and future, uh, in, in the near term, um, Betson is um, is the only fully uh, authorized, fully licensed onshore business in the country, and and we and we are a single vertical um, operator in Brazil because of the existing regulation. We we are just into the horse business um, and from there we are basically um, making all the making all the tweaks to to have uh, the features in place by the moment the regulation unfolds for sports betting okay and 75 percent acquisition correct me if I'm wrong uh, moving yes. moving forward how does uh, such an MA deal impact the the business no the the future growth and the prospects for the business to have a partner like Betsin. well it's it's uh, as i was saying we are we are um, 
um, upgrading uh, our products. I mean, we are going to launch a proprietary platform here for horse racing. We are beefing up our payment methods. We are we are starting with some marketing initiatives in the in the, in the short term. So at the end of the day, we are beefing up the whole value proposition for Brazil because of the partnership with Betson. That's pretty much what we are doing, anticipating the opening of the markets. Understood. Christina, um, pleasure to have you with us. Walk us, Thank you. Walk us through a bit the, 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 the market situation across the LATAM region. I mean, we saw a fine example in Brazil. Um, there's a lot of activity happening. It's obviously the biggest uh, slice of the LATAM cake, if we can put it that way. Um, but which other uh, countries are investors looking at with increased appetite? I mean, walk mm -hmm. us through Argentina, Mexico, Colombia, which is regulated. Shed yeah. a bit of light on all of those, please. My pleasure. Well, th thanks everyone, and thank you to Sigma for for the opportunity uh, to be here today. So, um, apart from Brazil, uh, where André is the man, he knows a lot more than uh, pretty much all of us. So, I'm not I'm not going to say anything else about Brazil apart that what you just mentioned. It's a very large opportunity, and hopefully, um, you know, it will be a, a real opportunity in in the short term. I expect it uh, to be. So from, from the market you mentioned, really what we're seeing at the moment, and I think Susan mentioned a very important thing. So we work with both uh, investors that have a more private equity or venture capital type of profile, and then the operators and, and the B2Bs that are um, usually European, international, and, and some of them also um, stock exchange listed, which is an important thing from the regulatory and compliance point of view. So what we're seeing right now at our firm, um, we're based out of Madrid, uh, as you know, but we cover the whole region through our partnerships that have been you know, in place for 15, 20 years. So I understand the buzz of the region right now, and it's in, obviously in the wake of some of the countries finally regulating online. So the, uh, the interest the is across all, all sectors. So you have interest from operators, yes. from public listed uh, mm -hmm. companies, as well as VCs and private equity. Correct. We've seen everything uh, from the big deal, the acquisition of Sirsa, which which was in a number of countries in Latin America two years ago by Blackstone, uh, from that to a number of other potential opportunities. And I know we are discussing M&A here, but it's also important to know that one thing that uh, both operators and also financial investors are looking at as is always have like a local let's say, local partner, even if it's just a minority, because it's really important to understand the region. You know, Andre has had the experience himself. It's very important to go hand in hand with somebody local. So it can be an acquisition, but we're also looking at partnership opportunities that develop as commercial partnerships and then have the, um, let's say, the M&A um, levers and options to turn it into an acquisition later down the road. We're seeing that a lot. So in terms of market, um, we're working actively now in Panama with the online regulation. Um, it's a very interesting market. As you know, it's a well-established casino market. It's been a, you know, a developed market for a number of years already. So um, Panama, also with the, presence. More, the interest is more for the casino rather than... Yes, but also online. Uh, we now have the online regulation in place and we're seeing international operators uh, penetrating the Panama online market, um, also hand in hand with local land based uh, casino operators, which is quite interesting. Um, we are waiting for Peru to finally settle down on online, but there's a lot of interest also in the retail market in Peru, the sports betting retail market. It's very interesting. Um, we are also seeing, as you mentioned, in Mexico, Mexico is one of the markets where we've been uh, more active during the last few years um, as people may know the regulations are really old they date back to the uh, late 40s with a regulation developing in the early 2000s there's no let's say black and white online regulation as we would expect with fully fledged technical standards and licensing procedures but there is an opportunity for the international online operators who are slowly but steadily also penetrating the market um, to operate online in Mexico alongside one of the existing, again, land-based licensees, which is a very interesting combination because the international operators usually bring in 
their online experience and the locals bring in their experience on the ground with payments, customer behavior, product choice, those kind of things. So it, it works really well. It's it's really, really interesting. And the market is unfolding now. We're looking at a number of situations, both pure M&A and, and commercial partnerships, as I mentioned. Then Colombia, as you said correctly, is a regulated market. It's a smaller market in terms of size, uh, but it's well established, both land-based and also now online, with some operators still coming in on the international side. Um, on Argentina, there was the famous tender last year for the online licenses of the province of Buenos Aires. Now the city of Buenos Aires is also uh, open. It's an open window for licensing yeah. whenever operators and, and B2C suppliers want, they can apply. Um, it's been, unfortunately, due to the elections by the end of last year, um, the, list, the uh, tender in the province of Buenos Aires was delayed. Licenses have not been granted yet. Um, we saw... By regulation, companies had to apply together with a local partner. Once again, uh, it was a very interesting experience. Unfortunately, the market has not yet uh, kicked off. Ho uh, hopefully, it will. And another jurisdiction that looks interesting, also for online, is Chile, um, which you know I think we we're going to have another session during during this Sigma event on Chile specifically. But it's interesting to mention that they will be regulating online, and and it's also a well-established market. Um, and otherwise, I think those are the most important to, ones to mention, but it's, um, I agree, you know, with both Susan and, and Andre that the region is highly, highly interesting. And um, final sentence, we should be all very aware that the, we always talk about LATAM as a region, but I think every country is one in itself. So every country deserves a different approach. That's, that's something that we've seen and it really has to be tailor-made and, and every Partnership is different, every tax rate is different, every regulator is different. Yeah, and uh, this is open to all, all, all three, all three guests um, from this panel. Uh, with political stability or instability, um, is that affecting uh, the appetite from investors? Uh, so across different states uh, in LATAM, at least across Western media, uh, you, you tend to see a certain degree of political instability in some regions more than in others. How is that affecting, if at all, uh, appetite from all over the world for LATAM as a market? Well, I can't start. <laughs> Let's talk about Brazil. It's a, very, it's a very narrow perspective that I have. I'm going to talk about Brazil specifically and, and about what we, we are seeing internally. Um, although the news are not very favorable to what's going on in Brazil, as you know, pandemic has hit Brazil very hard, and we have a very controversial, to be very polite, president uh, in charge in the country. Um, economically, um, the, co the, 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 the country is, 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 is moving ahead, it's struggling, of course, the economy is going down, but it's, it's a, a, at least the agenda on a microeconomic agenda and the reforms are going ahead without any any significant bumps. Things are progressing. As I mentioned before, the regulation is is, 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 is progressing. We had a milestone last week that the presidential decree formalizing how the, the regulation will take place, who is going to take charge. This is a very uh, clear and, 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 and known process that is going to take place. It's going to be run by BNDES, which is the National Bank for Development, uh, inside of um, a, a, a body that basically takes care of infrastructure projects. So from a perspective of our industry itself, in Brazil at least, things are progressing very smoothly. And as a strategic project, I think that um, we can we can predict uh, a favorable outcome, and the whole friction on the macro level, on the political uh, headlines, are not is not affecting specifically the opportunity of sports betting regulation in Brazil. Yeah. Uh, I, can talk, I can talk on behalf of Betson. I mean, we are uh, we are still excited, very excited about the opportunity in Brazil and working um, on the base case that the regulation will take place uh, in the short, medium term. 
Yeah, and, and I mean, rephrasing it also, there's a political uncertainty across, you know, you can say every, every continent. Um, in Africa, in Asia, don't get me started on Asia, and, and also in, uh, in LATAM. So, so I'm assuming and I'm hoping investors are also looking beyond uh, that form of clutter and uh, are still looking at investing in those regions. So what's, what's your take on, on that? Susan? Uh, I, I agree with you, Emma. And I think there are probably two, two points to, to, to follow up on what Andre said, which is um, the, 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 I think position of each of the LATAM jurisdictions is on a slightly different part of the curve to Europe or Asia or the US. Um, there may be political instability, but, but so is there elsewhere. Uh, what we have here is an economic deficit that is potentially extreme right across LATAM. And there will therefore be the desire and the will of government to encourage tourism and economic rebuilding and collaboration with the private sector. And that will be external investors, whether they are operators or financiers. And that will be right across uh, integrated resorts down to online um, land-based um, slots, you name it, sports betting. Uh, so, so I think you have a more willing governmental perspective, um, which is quite different to the sort of Asian perspective here, which is uh, particularly aggressive in terms of China right now, um, with the uh, the movement of gambling funds being seen as a national security risk, and different again to the European perspective where you have um, a highly toxic uh, political, uh, cultural um, debate and fight going on between governments, operators and, and the, the, the customer around where is the damage being caused and the harm being caused within the gambling industry. So the two, the two large markets of LATAM, the US, and, and I'm leaving Africa just aside for one minute in that debate, but they, they are on slightly different trajectories, which makes them, I think, a better bet, as Andre said, for, for investment. The second point is, I think investors have to be realistic. You know, people plowing into new markets without really understanding them. Christina's point about local partners, understanding cu cultural norms, they're absolutely critical to make success of any business. You, you just can't go head first into, in, into these markets and not understand what you're doing. Yeah. Christina, anything to add on that? No, I fully agree with, with both Susan and Andre. Obviously, tax money is, is critical these days for a number of reasons. And and more so in, in most of these jurisdictions that we're talking about, which have been severely hit by, by COVID and, and other things, right? So what I'm seeing on the approach from regulators is that they welcome international investors, they welcome international players also from the know-how side, but because bear in mind that regulators across the region, um, and I'm now specifically discussing online, but it happens with integrated resorts, as, as Susan mentioned, too, which is a very interesting area to touch upon in places like Brazil and Mexico, specifically. Um, bear in mind that regulators have dealt so far with an industry that's land-based, um, that's more very casino based some sports betting in most jurisdictions, but they have to familiarize themselves and, and let's say lose um, fear of the unknown, which is online, right? And the operators, the international investors and the operators that are coming in are also helping regulators to understand that, you know, you can safely carry out an operation even if the servers are abroad, even if, you know, you are a company that's not necessarily based locally, that you can still handle your players with care, that you can assure that they play responsibly, you can handle bank accounts in respect of AML policies. So regulators are also benefiting in the sense that they are learning a lot. Um, and bear in mind also that gaming is usually regulated by either the Ministry of the Economy or the Home Ministry in some of the countries. So they are very close to the core of the government. Yeah. Um, and I think this wave also is, is in favor because they are learning a lot from, from the investors, so they welcome them. Yeah, and uh, you bring another very important point here. 
which is COVID and also tax money. Uh, do you think COVID is speeding up the awareness by government on the need to regulate the space? And is that in return enticing investors to look into LATAM even more uh, eagerly? I think, I mean, it has not brought anything new to the table. It has rather, in my opinion, accelerated so things. Mm. Uh, so I think COVID has accelerated the appetite to tap new markets, especially online, because we've seen that, um, you know, despite the lack of sports event, uh, online has sort of kept up during the pandemic, whereas logically, because there was a lockdown, land-based operations were completely on hold. So I think operators have realized the importance of, ha of having a diversified offer, both in terms of product and geographically. So that has accelerated the appetite um, for this region and other regions too. And regulators will accompany that because of the tax money. Yeah. Andrea, any, anything to add on that? No, I couldn't agree more. That's precisely what's going on. I mean, we've seen there are two types of companies at this moment. The ones that were hit and they're struggling to survive and the ones that are surfing the wave and, and going after opportunities, assets that are at the right price. So that's why um, we see a lot of action in, in M&A nowadays. Yeah. And, you know, talking about M&A, Another sector that is obviously embraced by online gambling is emerging technology, be it blockchain, be it the adoption of cryptos, be it artificial intelligence, big data. So when we talk about all these facets of emerging technology, and when one considers that there's still millions across uh, LATAM who are unbanked, who do not have access to a bank account, um, how does that interest investors in looking into this region uh, in terms of mass adoption of new technology? In this sense, I'll give you an example. Uh, there's millions of players now who cannot access necessarily a number of operators because they do not have access to a payment system that facilitates that. But with the adoption of uh, new payment systems, including cryptocurrencies, all of a sudden you have a new stream of players coming into the system who were not accessible as yet. Um, is that playing a role among investors into looking into LATAM? Because the opportunity for mass adoption in emerging technology is even more practical than in developed countries like, like across Europe and across the States. I, I, I I was mentioning earlier that I, I think some clients have underestimated the, the, the payments infrastructure uh, and as a result it has slowed down or In, slightly Investors, you mean? Uh, e either operators or investors. Yeah. They, have, they, they have not calibrated, I think, well enough what are the, the, the difficulties in terms of the payments system. I mean, Andre will probably be able to give a perfect scenario for the local payments, the attractiveness of his business to Betson because there was, you know, a, a, a defined um, mature model there that they that they could look at. But on the whole, uh, in, in payments um, adoption, mobile alternative payment methods, um, cultural issues and uh, corruption issues are in one large bucket, I think, in investors' minds about how do you navigate through all of those in, in the entire region. Yeah. If we had to summarize, because the clock is ticking, and if we had to summarize three main issues for investors to look into when uh, eyeing LATAM as a market to invest in, uh, what would they be, Andre? Three, three main issues to keep in mind before throwing money yeah. <laughs> onto LATAM. I think that having the local partner is probably the, 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 the most important one uh, end of the day. Um, it's, it's about 
um, local partners, local marketing deals, and and in case in the case of Brazil, I would say that um, the third one would be probably payment methods, because at this moment um, this sector is totally unknown and it takes some time for you to to get along to 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 get whitelisted with the local payment methods the big ones in the e-commerce world so there is a lot of uh, energy to be focused on that so pretty much those three my perspective yeah your concluding remarks Christina and Susan before we wrap this up please sure um, I agree with Andre I would add Another thing, which is regulatory and compliance, it's key to understand the dynamics of the market and how the regulator thinks, because these regulations are, apart from Colombia, maybe, uh, they are not as developed as European or international operators would expect. So it's important to spend time on that one and, and also understand what we would call the ongoing compliance with, with all the local requirements. And there, the local partner, again, is, is key. But I'm very optimistic about the whole region in for the coming uh, 12 to 18 months. There's there's a lot to happen. So are we and we can't wait to set foot in Brazil for our inaugural show next year. We, I wish we were there today, but uh, COVID had other plans. <laughs> and Susan, the last remarks from you before we wrap uh, things up. I mean, it's pretty much what Christina and Andre said. I think the other factor is probably cultural, that uh, a local partner, particularly in the region, is essential. Um, but also understanding that you cannot necessarily just translate your business, your products from a European perspective um, in, in, into the region without understanding what kind of sports betting products, what kind of sports, um, what kind of casino games, where, where, where the where the local population um, are at in terms of their own perspective on what they like to do in, in, in gaming and not translate something else. So it is about having enough time and it is about a little bit of resilience and patience in terms of getting into a new market, entirely different to the States, entirely different to Europe, and you just can't re replicate your own model. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that note. And this brings us to an end of this M&A panel discussion. Um, I think it's safe to say that LATAM is here to stay. Interest is brimming across, uh, you know, every region from investors into the LATAM market. And it reminds me of, uh, of a term that was coined by Thomas Friedman, where we're talking a lot about globalization, but it's important also to focus on localization. That is to take into perspective and keep in mind uh, the different needs across different regions in Latin America. Uh, so this is, I think, uh, the take home for anyone watching this panel. Thank you again for being with us, Susan, Andre, Christina. Back to you, Jess. Thank you. Thanks, Anna. Thank you.